Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing show. This week we're going to tackle the thorny subject of efficacy in the boardroom. Right now we're seeing a lot of uh, investors suffer with lower dividends and poor share price performance. We're seeing employees in some industries be laid off. What are the CEOs and boards doing about this and how are they in the same boat as the other stakeholders? It's going to be controversial this one, it's going to be an eye opener for some of you too and I certainly hope you enjoy the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my faithful companion, Mr. Mitchell Laurentiel. Thanks for having me, Mr. Baxter, on the show. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, as always, one of my favorite parts of the week, getting in the studio. And in the new studio, it smells the, pretty good. It smells it's, of, well, I'm glad we just had the painters here. It smells like fresh timber here. It's beautiful. It, is. it smells great, doesn't it? Not Absolutely. that you can get that. There's no 4D on this, but uh, there we go. There we go. Okay, now, interesting topic today, Mr. B, that I would like to cover. One that's probably pretty relevant, given that you know share prices are all over the shop, dividends have been cut, that's efficacy in the boardroom. And specifically, that means CEO remuneration as such. Well, this is a bit of a thorny subject, and I Absolutely. guess any of the ASX CEOs that are listening will be trembling in fear as to where we're going with this. Not at all. It is a very interesting area, and I guess, um, you know, right off the bat, we're not um, cause-driven investors in terms of what we do, yet there are um, a lot of things going on in the marketplace right now which don't necessarily sit that well with investors, hence why we're covering it today. We were asked, you know, what's your thought on the remuneration package of a, a particular CEO? So that's what we're talking about. And uh, let's get into it. Let's jump straight into it. Now, obviously, dividends have been cut. For example, you know, CBA, NAB, Westpac, ANZ, the big four have all mm. cut their dividends yep. by at least 50%. Share prices are in that bearish fashion or most, say for example, even like the big banks. Mm. Yet, is it the same for all stakeholders? Are they feeling the same pain? Yeah, it doesn't seem to be that way, does it? Um, you know, if we take a, a proxy for these, and, uh, and look, let's look at a real mixed bag of companies. I'm thinking, if we look at a handful, we'll talk about CBA being the biggest bank. Sure. Uh, we'll talk about Qantas, which has certainly been no stranger to the headlines. Mr. Of, Joyce, absolutely. Mr. Joyce, indeed, over the last few weeks. Uh, we'll take a look at AMP, certainly uh, a bit of a dog's breakfast there. And, and, and probably another benchmark in there uh, that we might look at is West Farmers. And they're four very, very different businesses, very different styles of management, and very different styles of both share price performance and remuneration. So they'll give us four uh, to get stuck into. We go to five, but I'm you know, stretching my, my, <laughs> my knowledge base to go into that level of detail. So let's start with the banks. And look, CBA came out uh, a couple of weeks ago with a 50% cut in its dividend, which in all fairness is the right thing to do. We're not talking about whether or not it was right to cut the dividend. Business has slowed down. It's important to retain the capital in the business. And let's not lose sight of the fact you know, seven point three billion dollars of profit is yeah, you know, it's a pretty healthy number. It's not a bad year, I would say. Mm. However, what we've seen is the share price drift down substantially, uh, so the shareholders have had a capital loss, uh, and we've also seen a fifty percent cut in that dividend. Yet, on a board level, and this is a company that's come out of the woods of the Royal Commission, not smelling of roses but nonetheless has come out of the other side of that where the CEO's remuneration is a nice half million dollar pay jump uh, up to around $4 million now for Matt Carmen, plus there are incentives uh, around that too. And that's the sort of thing that at lots of AGMs tends to not sit too well. Um, I don't know if you've been to a, a, an ASX or any listed company AGM, and if anyone listening has or hasn't, but it's actually quite an interesting day out to sit there and you can identify the different sort of pockets of investors. You've got the institutional investors, uh, you've got a lot of retail investors, mum and dads that are going out for a free cup of tea and, and some entertainment for the day and everything in between. And, and seeing the pain that's very much on the faces and in the wallet and bank account for those retirees in particular with those dividends have been cut, and then you hear that the board have approved a pay rise for the CEO, you can kind of see that sort of gravel in the gearbox grinding with people, it's not fun to see. It must hurt when, say for example, your income in CBA is being cut by 50%, that's mm. a big cut to take in your income, yeah. and the CEO is getting you know, a pay rise of, of, of a couple of mil or whatever it may mm. be. That has to hurt, and I guess mm. that comes down to what the value systems are for the company. And mm. I know this is a really big part of how we screen out our companies fundamentally. Yep. One of our three pillars of analysis is, is fundamentals. Sure. What are your thoughts on that? Look, having the values aligned with all stakeholders is something that's that's very very important. And and I think you know the whole notion of CEO remuneration and. For what it's worth, I think you know, my, my notion of that would be that rather than pay a cash bonus, any and all CEOs in a listed company, sure, you've, you, you've got to compensate someone for their expertise. They're running a big business and they're not doing a 35-hour week in doing it. There's an enormous amount of responsibility sure. that goes alongside that kind of role. But rather than a cash bonus, pay the incumbent in stock. Again, no problem with that. But put it on escrow. And they can't access that stock for maybe five or eight years 
uh, from the date that it's awarded. And the reason for that kind of timeline is that the decisions that are made today should be all about setting the business up for what it does in the future. And as the CEO, your job is, I guess, amongst other things, to steward the company, look after the stakeholders, the shareholders, and so on and so forth. But it should be providing a long-term plan for the company to come out of the woods. And so if you've done a good job of that, being remunerated based on stock, knowing you've done the right thing and you've put in place a great platform if and when you step out of that role or if you're still in that role five or ten years later and some CEOs stick around for a really, really long time. You know, a good example of that, Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan. He had $1.5 million a year salary, yet he's running you know, one of the largest financial institutions in the world. Okay, his net worth's over a billion as a consequence of what he's done in that business he's over the last okay. 25, 30 years. Sure. But he's not taking it upfront salary, he's taking it in stock in a lot of cases, which is where he's built his wealth. Now, the advantage to that is if you do a great job and there's a continuity program and the new CEO comes in and continues the good work you've done, well, the value of your remuneration goes up in line with that. Uh, and I reckon a really good example of that would be, would probably be West Farmers. You know, and I often talk in a training, you know, think about West Farmers as one of the better run businesses. Who's the CEO these days there? I believe his name's Rob Scott. Okay, so Rob Scott took over from Richard Goiter. Richard Goiter, Huge fan of Richard Goiter. Do you know um, him personally? I haven't met him personally yet, no, but I'd like to. I think he'd be, there are a couple of people in Western Australia I would really like to meet in business. Andrew Forrest, uh, uh, and we've got a possible in there with a, a relative of his that's a client, um, would be fantastic. But I also think Kerry Stokes is someone I'd really love to meet. Anyone that's read his biography, um, it's, a, it's an incredible life story he's had. And I think Richard Goiter, from a corporate responsibility perspective, would be good because he left the West Farmers operation a couple of years ago, and Richard Brooks has taken over the helm. And look, Richard Brooks is pretty well paid. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you've got a business that's a share price at an all-time high, has continued to pay great dividends to its shareholders, sure. runs itself, you know, and okay, they were involved with some underpayment at Bunnings, as a lot of companies were in terms of underpayment, but that's been sorted out. In general, a very, very well-stewarded business. And the work that Goida did over the really long tenure he had at the company is just stuck around and is being added to now and reflected by the share price. So, yeah, if you got awarded shares at 20 bucks and they're now worth 42, well, your compensation's double what it should have been, but that's only because you did a great job and you set the business up to grow. Now, to my mind, that's an alignment of values from a CEO sure. remuneration perspective. And we actually had a trade out on Wes Farmers today, funnily enough, you say that. And I think, you know, one of the main things I actually got taught at uni was the whole notion of a successful business, the whole goal is the maximization of shareholder wealth. That mm. is the goal of a business. Yep. And as the CEO, the figurehead, the main decision maker, that has to be at the forefront of your mm. mind. And that's not just about today, yep. that's about five, 10 years down the track. And if you get remunerated with shares and you can't access them for a while, mm. you've really got no choice other than that. Absolutely, and you know, again, if you look at your fiduciary duty as a CEO is to act in the best interest of the business and therefore its shareholders, sure. so there we go. Okay. Now, we can look at some Oh, well, I'm sure you've got a couple of other examples. What have you got lined up for? Oh, we, we said we talk about AMP, if you like, mm. CBA. We've spoken about Wes Farmers. All right. Well, let's take AMP because that's AMP. Uh, it's a dog's breakfast. Let's, let's shoot some fish in a barrel. And <laughs> yeah, you know, genuinely, as a business, and I really feel for long-term AMP shareholders, it got up to just under forty dollars on the day it listed. It's a dollar forty-five today. Yeah, if you go back 10 years ago, it was around $6, $6.50. So the shareholders there have just been absolutely Slammed. done like a dog's dinner, you know, just totally. You've also um, had a rotating, literally revolving door in the boardroom. Chairman resigns, David Murray came in. David Murray, of course, former CEO of, of Commonwealth Bank. Uh, and I've not met David Murray. I've met his predecessor, Ralph Norris, on a number of occasions. Lovely guy, really, really nice guy, and his wife, Pam. But... David Murray is regarded in the industry as something of a dinosaur and, and, and quite a dogmatic kind of person. And yet he's taking over the reins as chairman in a business that's come out of a royal commission and let's face it, AMP really didn't cover itself in glory uh, through the royal commission, fee for no service, you know, deceased estates being charged, advisory fees and the like. You wouldn't line. let them in your house now, would you? You wouldn't trust them. Go back 20, 30 years ago and it was the AMP, or the man or the lady from the AMP are coming over, we'll have a pot of tea around the table and talk about you know, what we're doing with our insurance. And you're quite right, unless you had your valuables locked up, you probably wouldn't want them in your house. <laughs> right. and, and that whole cultural um, bust up, if you will, of a very, very trusted brand is just being decimated to one of the least trusted, not just by its customers and not shown to be that through the Royal Commission, but by its staff. And it's got this culture, it would seem from what we see in the media, of bullying, sexual harassment, and various other things. So we've had a, a terrible performance of the share price. We've had a revolving door at board level. 
there's a culture that's toxic. And you have a CEO, uh, Francesco de Ferrari's current CEO, used to be at Credit Suisse. He was an investment banker, Investment right? banker, right? Sure. Big job, three year job to turn the business around. Now his base remuneration is what, 1.7, 1.9 billion, uh, million, Ballpark, so yeah. around about that. But with incentives is around 13.4 million. I think his bonus has just actually increased by about 66% mm. this year, despite the, sh- you know, the business recording say two and a half billion dollar loss, for yeah. example. Okay, so there's something of a misalignment there in, massive. in that respect. You've had a massive shakeup where the chairman, David Murray resigned and stepped off the board uh, as chairman and a couple of other heavy hitters, senior level executives and board members stepped away from the business too. Um, but that board that's trying to rebuild the trust in the business signed off on the appointment of a senior executive who was known to have settled a sexual harassment allegation in case, very, very public. Anyone that's following the financial news will see that. And yet you're prepared to promote somebody like that in an organization that currently is renowned for bullying and workplace harassment into a senior executive position. And it just shows that as a board, they don't get it. Sure. They don't get the damage that those decisions are doing, not just in terms of the brand from a customer perspective, but from the brand from an employee and team member perspective. Now, we mentioned earlier about West Farmers and the culture at West Farmers is a very, very strong culture. And yet you've got pretty much the opposite in play for the AMP as it stands at the moment, which is very, very sad for a, a, a stalwart, trusted Australian brand to literally be dragged through the mud and, and, and left in the mud, and probably rightly so that it is there. Now, if we look at the remuneration of the CEO, not only uh, is it fairly generous, it's more than double the average remuneration for a CEO in an ASX top 20 company. It's already been paid overs. The bonus in the remuneration uh, packages and the hurdles for them, even if AMP underperforms its competitors and the index by 10%. In other words, if the index goes up 5% uh, and and they're down down 5%, he's still going to qualify for a bonus on his remuneration. And you just wonder where does that leave the other stakeholders like the shareholders that are relying on a dividend and having watched their capital get pummeled away. Okay, so taking it back to the example of Wes Farmers, Rob Scott, he's paid around about 6.7 mm. million per annum, which is about average. Mm. That's a business that has a $42 billion market capitalization. Yeah, I mean, it's a juggernaut of a business. Yet AMP CEO is being paid double that, and it's a terrible business. The share price is, mm. is, is down at $1.40. Or, or if you look at it uh, like for like with, with Commonwealth Bank, you know, a seven plus billion dollar profit, and the CEO's getting paid four million. So it Why seems like a well, interesting with AMP, and I know it seems like an AMP bashing session, uh, and it's not, it. not intended to be. This just shows the, well, it's an easy target, but it just shows you know, the, the, the nature in which some companies are out of touch uh, with the perception of the business, which is very, very important from an investor perspective. And sure. We'll put a ribbon around that in a moment. So you know, a, a lot of board members are out of touch with that and the damage that's being done. And, and it's very, very sad because you're not going to rebuild trust in your customers and you're certainly not going to build loyalty and trust with your staff when you've got such a, such a dramatic out of gear situation that's there. Now, he's got a three year plan to turn the business around. So look, take your 1.7 or 1.8 salary. You deserve that. No one's quibbling about that's what fine. the salary is. You deserve it. You're running an ASX listed business. There's a huge pressure that goes there. And in all fairness, it's probably a substantial pay cut from being in investment banking. Sure. But the cream on the cake, the bonuses and the incentives, put it on escrow. And maybe those their options that are exercised at say a dollar eighty a share. Something simple like that. And if AMP share price is at five bucks in four years' time because he's done a great job of turning the business around, he's gonna cash in and it would have earned every cent that he's got. But to have a free swing, mm, that just doesn't really sit too well, especially in a situation where investors are being forced to take a pay cut. Sure. Now, probably the biggest bone of contention and probably one of the most dichotomous CEOs to talk about right now. I know exactly what you're going to say. Hmm. Go ahead. No, you, you, you've worked with me for a long time. No, 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 no you, do it, you do it, you do it. Okay, so if we talk about Qantas and, and Alan Joyce. <laughs> now, I haven't been renowned as being the biggest fan of Alan Joyce for a number of years. And if we go back to the, you know, the $23, $24 million remuneration package back in wow. 2018. 24 mil in one year. Yeah, it's, it's a big number uh, and on a business that makes a fraction of the profit that West Farmers does. But that aside, and you, know, you could argue that it was due to lower aviation fuel prices and sorting unions out and things like that. Irrespective of all of that, the way Alan Joyce and the Qantas board Interestingly enough, by the way, the Qantas chairman is Richard Goida. No, he's not okay. the West Farm, he's the chairman. So you wonder how much of that corporate stewardship has been sort of passed on sure. from a chairman level now, he's not a CEO. Great question. Um, yeah, and again, very, very interesting operator. So in terms of what Alan Joyce has been doing, 
And he's in a very, very difficult position because he's running a company that effectively cannot operate. And he can't operate because the travel restrictions, state bans, COVID, everything else. Has he taken a pay cut on the back of that? Yeah, he has. How uh, big? And, well, we'll get onto that in a moment. Um, you know, Qantas has obviously laid off a lot of staff. 6,000 initially, another 2,500 this week. And, and, and you know, there have been a lot of calls, particularly, you know, uh, Anthony Albanese, Labour leader, came out and said, oh, you know, you shouldn't be laying off people in this situation. Uh, remember, Alan Joyce's responsibility is to the business and the stakeholders and specifically the shareholders. Um, I think um, it's Michael Caine, the leader of the Tra Transport Workers Union, you know, calling for Alan Joyce's head on a stick. And he's saying, well, you've been getting JobKeeper for these people. Why are you now getting rid of them? And the answer is simple. There are no jobs there for them. And we talked about the notion of JobKeeper being used to keep ghost jobs going down the track. Now, sure. the move that Qantas has made by outsourcing is to remove that liability. Remember, if someone's on JobKeeper, the employer is still liable for holiday pay and they're liable for sick pay, which on thousands and thousands of people really starts to accumulate. It's a lot. Um, but more specifically, are those jobs going to be there in the next three, six, 12 months? And I suspect the answer is no. You know, I'm not making any plans to travel right now this year and probably not into the early half of next year, certainly overseas. And so you can't see any light at the end of the tunnel for Qantas. And as a CEO, he's made the hardcore decision to say, we've got to cut this and we're going to outsource the work if we need it by removing the liability from our balance sheet and having an independent subcontractor that comes in. Now, that's unpalatable for a lot of people. And they go, well, the fat cat's still making the money. Actually, no. Alan Joyce came out in March and he's actually foregone any further salary this year. And there'll be people who sit back and say, well, he can afford it on the 23 million got there. He doesn't have to do that. And this is leading by example. In fact, the entire Qantas board have universally taken a 30% pay cut. Sure. And again, the naysayers out there will say they can afford it. Mm -hmm. But the reality is they're doing the right thing in setting the precedent at the top of the organization for it to cascade through. Mm -hmm. So that Team Qantas, what's left of it in the new world that comes out of this, there's a level of trust and alignment in management. And that's something that Alan Joyce as a CEO, as I say in the past, I haven't been a particular fan, but looking at the way that he's dealt with some of the bigger challenges, unions in particular within Qantas, and restructuring that business, he's rolled the sleeves up and has done what's needed. And leading from the front like that, saying, listen, I'm not gonna take any pay. Sure, he can afford it, but it's a matter for him. He's entitled to that money, but he's elected not to, sure. to set the right message for the rest of the team that are doing it very, very tough at other parts of the business. You're absolutely right, and the fish rots from the head first, as they say. It's a great expression. Where would you pick that one from? I think I heard my dad say that. Maybe my mum. I steal a lot of things off my dad. Anyway, for example, ANZ actually did the same thing. So Shane Elliott, for example, was the CEO of mm. ANZ. He took a $1 million pay cut this mm. year, and the rest of the board took another 20% pay cut mm. on top of that as well. That's very, very similar, you know, good stewardship through through this crisis. Yeah. As a shareholder sitting in a ballroom, sat there listening to the numbers being explained and hearing those stories, I'm not going to say buys loyalty, but it gets a nod of the head going, thank you, because yeah. you've recognised the difficulty that we're in. And sure, again, the nay says, oh, it's only a million, what's it to him? He's got millions, but it's about doing the right thing. And that kind of character, I think, is what shapes an organisation's DNA. So we look at what we like to invest in. And as I mentioned right at the start, we're not activist investors where we're pushing a particular agenda for you know, an environment type product or a technology or, or whatever it may be. We're here to make money. We're here to help our clients make money, right? That's our role, simple as that. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know, when you use button a sentence, you're supposed to ignore everything you've said previously. <laughs> However, at the same time, I think one of the screens that we use, that litmus test, one, is this a business that is a bigger or smaller part of the future. And number two, what is the value system in that business? Not because we're gonna invest in the line from an, a, a green purpose, but when you've got strong leadership that does lead from the front and does take some bark off personally to say, look, we're all in this together and show some level of solidarity. And that'll grind a lot of people in the labor movement. We're using the word solidarity when we're talking about a board. But the lead from the likes of the Qantas board and indeed that from ANZ is showing the troops at ground level that, hey, we're aware of the pain here. And that shows a company that not only values its brand, but values its staff and its stakeholders in the form of shareholders. And that is a critically important set of attributes for any kind of CEO and board team. And it's important to consider before you invest in a company or, or, or trade it for that matter. Now, there's a lot to take in there, Mr. B, and we are coming to the mm. end of the broadcast. So how can our listeners out there digest this information, package it up in a nice, simple mm. way, where they can actually use that for their own investment purposes. Look, 
that's a tricky one for a lot of people that are walk up start to this kind of thing because you know we've got we're blessed we've got decades of this kind of hardcore encyclopedic knowledge of various companies around the world what they do how their boards operate and so on and that's quite hard to replicate but with a done for you service using easy trade and the system that we've provided this is just another one of the screens that we use to help decide where we're going to be planting the flag for the next trade and it's not one we talk about particularly because let's face it it's not that sexy you know and we don't go through and look at executive remuneration reports. It's not about diving into that level of minutiae. What it's about is getting the broad strokes right. And as a business, when visions and values line up with something that resonates with investors and their staff, you've got a magic combination. Apple is sensational at doing things like that. As I say, West Farmers have dominated that space forever. And whilst he's going to be pilloried for having to swing the axe, and it's not a decision he's taken lightly to get rid of the level of staff that they have at Qantas, it's important to make sure that the, the company survives. It's his 100th year. It's anniversary, I think, September, October this year, 100 years it's been in business. And he's not going to be the CEO that stewards it into the ground. He's going to do and make the hard decisions that are needed so that when all of this nonsense is finally over and we're we're able to roll out the other side and re-emerge that there's a business there that we can be proud of and that provides a service that we'll use and can employ Australians and get us around doing what we need to do best, which is enjoy the world we live in. Absolutely. Efficacy in the boardroom, you've heard it here first. Thanks very much, Mr. B. Pretty light session, that one, but really, really good information out there and um, a lot of good advice moving forward. Pleasure, Mitch, anytime. Cheers. Well, there you have it, guys. Efficacy in the boardroom. Make sure you leave a review and a rating and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.